Uh, we're going to read Daniel chapter 8 as we go back to our Daniel ser- series, uh, verses 1 through 27, the entire chapter 8 of Daniel. Let's hear what the Lord has for us this morning. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the Ulai Canal. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him, and there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and instead of of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven." Out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. It grew great, even to the host of heaven, and some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And a host will be given over to it it together with the regular burnt offering because of transgression, And it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Ulai, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for a first the appointed time of the end. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. And the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power." And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power, and he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes. And, shall be, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision for it refers to many days from now. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. And then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have given us your entire word, and I ask that you would set it apart now for its purposes in teaching, in instructing, rebuking, and correcting, Lord, in all righteousness, and training up in all righteousness. And Lord, I pray for Trent as he comes up to deliver this passage, God, I pray that you would give him a boldness, Lord, and a joy as he preaches this this passage, and as we listen to him, Lord, I pray that you would give us hearts that are, are ready to hear this word, Lord. Thank you for your gift of your word to us, and I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
Well, as we read there at the end, the effect of Daniel's having received this vision was that he lay sick for a few days, and uh, so have I uh, this week in preparing for this message, because it's another difficult text, as much of the back half of Daniel is, but the message it contains is important for us. As uh, some of you know, my wife Emily and I have enjoyed for quite a number of years marathon training, and as you probably know, marathon is a 26.2 mile foot race where you seek to cover that amount of ground as fast as you can. And believe it or not, people do this for fun. Uh, not only do they do it for fun, they actually pay money to do it. Um, we have enjoyed it and have learned a number of life lessons through the process of training and for and preparing for marathons. One of the things that happens as you're training for a marathon is that you are, you're actually training your body day after day to suffer. Uh, you're preparing yourself to get used to feeling terrible <laughs> and to keep going. And that's, that's essentially what you're doing day after day so that on race day, when you step up to the line, you've paid a bunch of money to do this, you run for 26 miles and whenever the hurt sets in and the pain and the difficulty, you say, I've been here before, I know what this is, I can keep going, I can keep pressing forward, I'm gonna finish the race. That's essentially what marathon training and the outcome is. Again, even as I say it, I say, why does anybody do this? <laughs> Nevertheless, the, uh, the lesson is important because I believe this is exactly how Jesus is preparing his followers for life in this world. He wants us to understand and to know ahead of time that as you go through life in this world, you're going to experience a world of hurt. You're going to suffer. There's going to be pain. There's going to be discomfort. It's not always going to be easy. There will be moments when you feel like you're tempted to quit. And in those moments, remember his words to you. He has told you to expect this. Do not be surprised. Listen to how he instructs the disciples in John chapter 15. He's speaking particularly about persecution here and the suffering that results from it. He says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. In other words, as you run the race of faith in this world, prepare for this. They persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. You're going to suffer, and I'm telling you in advance, so that when it comes upon you, you're not surprised. In fact, he tells us exactly why he's telling us this in chapter 16, verse 1, where he says, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. In other words, if you were to go through your Christian life and suddenly you experience persecution and hardship on account of your faith and Jesus hadn't told you in advance to expect that, you might be tempted to think, well, this isn't what I signed up for. I signed up for an easy life. I signed up for a better life than I had before and yet here I am, I'm suffering, I'm experiencing hardship. Things, it seems like there are forces that are out there against me, seeking to destroy me. And Jesus says, I've told you this so that when it happens, you do not fall away. You don't give up the race, but you remember what I said, and you keep pressing on, you keep moving forward, you keep being faithful, even to the end. Well, this passage in Daniel 8 serves a similar purpose. It is a vision that is future for Daniel, but it's actually past for us. The events prophesied here have already taken place, and so we might wonder, well, what's the value of us talking about something that's already happened? Well, I hope to show you as we go through the passage. But what it does for Daniel, and I believe also serves to do for us, is it prepares Daniel and the people who are coming after him to enter a world of hurt and to know that in the midst of it, God has not abandoned them. He is right there with them, and he is still sovereignly accomplishing all of his purposes for his people. And what the vision tells us and tells them is that the kind of faith required to persevere is not the kind of faith that lasts for a day or a week or a few years, but it's faith for the long haul. In the face of trials and persecutions that are sure to, that are sure to come, 
We must continually put our trust in the God who is sovereign over all of history. Now that theme may sound familiar to you. I feel like a broken record. We've basically been hitting on that same exact thing multiple times over the last few weeks. It's partly because the Bible hits on it a lot, and it's partly because I believe that the Holy Spirit would have us to get this firmly implanted in our minds and hearts, because times of suffering and persecution will come. We happen to be living in an anomalous place and an anomalous period of history here in the United States, that we have been largely free of any kind of serious, coordinated persecution. But last week, we remembered the persecuted church around the world in the day of prayer. And, and, and we know that for our brothers and sisters across the world, persecution is a real and daily reality. We have been spared here largely, but we don't know for how long. And so Jesus would have us be prepared that when those days of trial and suffering come, particularly on account of your faithfulness to him, don't consider it strange and don't be surprised, but rather take hold of this faith that over all of it, God is sovereign. This is the kind of faith that's required for the long haul. So let me share with you three things that I think are, uh, are pegs, essentially, on which we can hang our faith when these difficult times are sure to come. First of all, the greatest superpowers will be brought low. Daniel shows us over and over and over again that the greatest superpowers of the world will be brought low. By way of background, in the first few verses of the chapter, we learn that this vision takes place during the reign of King Belshazzar. He was a Babylonian king, so that places this vision somewhere before chapter 5 in the book of Daniel. We're talking approximately 550, 549 BC when Daniel receives this vision. Now, he would have been living in Babylon when he received the vision, but as you see here, when he had the vision, the vision placed him in Susa by the Ulai Canal, which would have been a couple of hundred miles east of where he was in the realm of the Medes and the Persians. And now the vision, we read in verse 3. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. So horns in the Bible, and especially in this kind of literature, represent strength, military strength and power, and the power of a leader or the power of an army. So this ram has two horns, one of them higher than the other. We'll see the significance of that as we go on. But with these horns, these symbols of his strength and power, the ram goes around ramming things. That's what rams do. And, and the effect of his ramming is that no beast could stand before him, right? This isn't a gentle sheep. This is a ram. He's, no one can stand before him. He goes around headbutting things with his horns, and he has his way. He rules the barnyard, so to speak, or wherever it is that rams spend their days. So he, he did as he pleased, and he became great. And, and it seems when the ram is in his heyday, nobody can stop him. He, he's going to do whatever he wants to, and he does until the goat comes along, verse 5. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground an indication of the speed with which this goat is traveling. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. So now you've got this crazed goat. And he is, he's a bad goat. <laughs> and he's got this conspicuous horn. He's a really strong goat, essentially. And he is just, you know, he's busting up the ram. And the ram that once looked so formidable, so invincible, is <laughs> unable to resist the power of the goat, <laughs> sorry. And uh, so this is, <laughs> the, the goat becomes exceedingly great, right? He's, he's super impressive. Nobody can stop the goat. But now the goat 
In the midst of his greatness, we read that his horn is broken, the symbol of his strength. This goat that seemingly couldn't be stopped, he, he already wiped, he trampled on the ram, the greatest thing we've ever seen to this point. Now he has his horn broken. And we read in verse 8, the goat became exceedingly great and he was strong. The great horn was broken and instead of it there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land, which is probably a reference to Israel and Jerusalem. It grew great even to the host of heaven. And some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. Stars probably being a reference to the children of Abraham who were said to be as numerous as the stars of the heaven and are being cast down and trampled upon. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host, which is probably a reference to God himself who rules those stars of Abraham. So here we have uh, the 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 goat whose horn was broken is replaced by four horns that come up. They're not as impressive as the one horn that was previously there. And amongst the four horns comes up a little horn that really thinks he's great and ultimately is going to trample upon these stars and, and at least conceive of himself as being as great as the God of heaven. Well, what does all of this mean? Thankfully, Daniel didn't know either, and he had to have it interpreted for him, and he wrote it down for us. So uh, what happens in verse 16 is he hears a voice, a man's voice, behind the banks of the Ulai, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. This is probably the voice of God speaking to his angel, Gabriel, who we encounter, of course, later in Scripture, and he is told to interpret the vision for Daniel, and he does. Um, verse 17 says, so he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face, a typical response to encounters with angels. But he said to me, understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. The time of the end is probably not a reference to the end of time, but the end of the scope of time that's in view here. And that would be approximately 400 years between when Daniel has written this until the temple is restored under a man named Judas Maccabees in the uh, second century BC. The, um, the vision interpreted is this in verse 19. He said, well, before I actually read for you this and what the interpretation is, you have to understand that this vision is given some 400 years before the events take place. So they're past for us, but these had not yet happened for Daniel. Now, because of that fact, critical scholars who don't believe that God supernaturally can work through his prophets and actually predict the future, they will say that this book could not have been written in the 6th century BC because it's too detailed in its description of the events of history as they're going to unfold. And so consequently, they say this had to be written probably in the second century BC, and it's written as though it was a prophecy, but in fact, it's actually just retelling events of history. Well, you have to decide for yourself. There are great reasons for believing what the church has always believed, which is that these events were written down in the sixth century BC, some 400 years before and, and while the events played out. One has to decide. If you decide that it is an actual prophecy, then you must reckon with the God who is able to reveal to his prophets things in advance, as the scriptures say. But here's the actual vision. Verse 19, he said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, which probably is the whole series of events around a man we're gonna meet named Antiochus Epiphanes. For it refers to the appointed time of the end. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. So there's the, the ram, the interpretive key to understanding the ram we saw earlier is that is a representation of the kings of Media and Persia. The two horns represent the two kings. One horn was greater than the other. Ultimately, we know in history that the, the Persian king became greater than the, the Median king and essentially brought the two kingdoms together. 
That's the picture of the ram. And again, this is future for Daniel. It hadn't happened yet, but it was going to happen because these are the ones who overthrew Belshazzar, as we read about in, in chapter 5. So this happens in Daniel's day. And that king uh, becomes like a ram who essentially conquers the, the, the world in a significant portion of that world at that time. He's great, invincible, a superpower, as we might describe him at this point. And at the peak of his seeming invincibility comes a goat. And we read about him in verse 21. The goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. So in the midst of the ram's heyday, the goat rises up, and this is the kingdom of Greece, and led by Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, as you know from history, was an extraordinary military genius who conquered more of the world than anybody had to that point, and he did it by the age of 33. So for all of you who are not yet 33, you have something to aspire to. And for all of you who are past that, what have you done with your life? <laughs> this king is amazing, right? He sits down and weeps because there's no more worlds left to conquer. He's at the height of his greatness, and at 33 years old, as we read here, the horn is broken. He dies, some sickness or fever. As great as his army was, as invincible as he seemed, sickness breaks the horn. In its place comes up four other kingdoms who have power, but not like his power. And the way history plays this out is extraordinary because what happens after Alexander's death is that his two sons are murdered and his four generals take the kingdom of Greece and they divide it up amongst themselves. And it was not nearly as great as the kingdom was under Alexander. Then we read in verse 23, at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. From one of those four kingdoms, the Seleucid kingdom, comes a man named Antiochus Epiphanes. His name, as he printed it on the money of the day, was Antiochus Theos Epiphanes, which means essentially Antiochus, God manifest. So you think quite a bit about yourself when you give yourself the label, I am God manifest. And he did think of himself that way. And we read in verse uh, 25, by his cunning he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind he shall become great. Without warning he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. Antiochus Epiphanes becomes great, at least in his own mind. He sets himself up in the place of God. He calls himself God manifest, as we'll see. He seeks to exterminate uh, Judaism from Israel. And yet, as important and as seemingly invincible as he was in his heyday, we read that the little horn also was broken. Do you see the pattern here of these great superpowers, great power resulting in boastful self-glorifying invites a great reversal. And we see it happen over and over and over again in history. Someone rises up, they think they're great, they even look great, and they drive, they, they, they ram around the world or they do what goats do around the world in their power. Or they, 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 they put themselves in the place of God and declare their own grandeur and greatness. And that's precisely what invites the great reversal where God brings the high and mighty low and humbles them. It happens on the individual level. It happens on the national level. But what we know from history, not only the history leading up to this point, but following that point, is that every great superpower that seemed invincible, whose reign seemed like it would never come to an end, every single one has come to an end. And what the Bible tells us is that's going to continue to happen all the way until the end of time. 
Just think back to the early part of the 20th century. You had the Third Reich, an impressive uh, new empire that had grandeurs, that re, uh, gr grandeurs of greatness, much like that of the time of Alexander the Great. And for a time, it seemed that Hitler and his henchmen could do anything they wanted and did anything they wanted. But in 1946, just a, a few months after the end of the war, 14 of his henchmen, who seemed invincible, were tried, found guilty, and executed. Their bodies were taken and burned to dust. They were loaded into a truck, driven an hour into the Bavarian countryside, and dumped in a muddy ditch where a rain drizzle washed them away. These men who before no one could stand against, no one could stop, no one could, and now just a little drizzle washed away. We know that there will be one king and one kingdom that remains. There's only one that will not have an end. It's interesting, the implications of that for us, who happen to live in the world's greatest superpower. And we don't know for how long the United States will be the world's greatest superpower. It may be for many more years to come. It may not even last for the rest of our own lifetimes. But we should not put our hope in the ultimate greatness of this nation. We can thank God for the greatness of this nation and for the many good things this nation has done in this world. But we should not get confused and think that this kingdom is the kingdom of God. For we know that this kingdom, like every other, will one day fall. Our role as God's people in the midst of this nation is to point the people of this nation to the coming kingdom of God and to the king who will never fail. We do take a moment today on this Veterans Day to thank our veterans for the service they have done for our country and for the good things that they have done for the world. But ultimately, our hope is not in this nation, and that's why we're not in the fetal position as a result of yesterday's elections, nor should we be overly elated as a result of yesterday's elections. Our hope is not in this world, our hope is in the Savior who's coming from heaven. The greatest superpowers are all going to fall. One kingdom and one king's going to remain. We need to maintain that perspective as we go through life in this world. Part of the reason why that's also important is because if by chance, or not by chance, but by God's providence, another superpower should arise and we should be trampled upon, you need to know just as certainly as this superpower will go down, so also will that one. And that is a comfort for God's people in times of suffering, most of whom were under the boot, not in the boot. All right, secondly, the most severe persecutions will have an end. That this vision shows us that as we look in verse 11. He's speaking of the little horn that's in Tychus Epiphanes, and he says, It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of transgression, and it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. This is a great description of what Antiochus Epiphanes actually did when he came against Jerusalem and the people of God. He he put an end to the regular burnt offering in the temple. He actually sought to exterminate the practice of Judaism and to unite his kingdom by having everybody worship the uh, Greek gods and embrace the Greek culture. Those who resisted that were killed, and thousands of Jews were killed because of their commitment to God and their faithfulness to him. Any He banned circumcision, so any boy who was found having been circumcised was executed, he uh, shut down the regular morning and evening sacrifices in the temple, and he desecrated the temple by entering into the Holy of Holies, where you know no one is to go, and sacrificing a pig on the altar to Zeus, and setting up an image of Zeus in the Holy of Holies. And just think about that from Israelite perspective. Having known what you know about the Holy of Holies and the holiness of God, imagine someone doing this to your most sacred place and your most sacred site. Imagine what must have gone through their minds, the fear, the, the, the indignation, the, the 
the wondering, has God abandoned us? And yet God gave his people this word in advance so they might know when this happened. He had not left them. He had not abandoned them. And God was still sitting on the throne. It says that he threw truth to the ground. And what we know about Antiochus was that he took the Torah scrolls and he destroyed them and he burned them. And that ultimately is what the enemies of God are always about doing, taking the truth and throwing it to the ground. It happens in many different ways, but that's ultimately the aim because they're driven by Satan, who is the father of lies. And so it's God's people's job to embrace and to proclaim the truth. It says that this is happening because of transgression, which reminds us that this is judgment upon the people of God for their idolatry, and that judgment is continuing. But even in the midst of the judgment, God has not abandoned them. We read in verses 23 to 25, at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face who understands riddles shall arise, his power shall be great, but not by his own power. It's going to be another power at work within him, enabling him to do these wicked and terrible things. And he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand and in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many and shall even rise up against the prince of princes and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. He's going, in other words, the prophecy is to the people of God, many years from the time of Daniel, that this evil man is going to rise up and he's going to succeed at essentially wiping out your practice of your faith and many of your lives. You understand now why Daniel says he lost sleep over the vision, why he was appalled at the vision and struggled to understand it. But even in the midst of the worst of it, God is still sovereignly restraining and controlling his enemies so that they can only do so far as he allows to serve his good purposes and his plan for his people. We read about the limits in verse 13. I heard a holy one speaking and another holy one said to the one who spoke, for how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? In other words, how long is this burnt offering not going to be allowed to happen, or are the people of God going to be trampled upon and the sanctuary be desecrated? And the answer is, in verse 14, he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. Scholars disagree about how long that 2,300 evenings and mornings is. It's either 2,300 mornings and evenings, which is six years and four months, and it refers to the time between when the high priest was killed by Antiochus until the time when the temple was restored under the uh, leadership of Judas Maccabees, some six plus years later. Or it may refer to the difference in time between when the burnt offerings, uh, when the when the temple was desecrated by the sacrifice to Zeus until when the temple was restored. But in either case, it's a fixed period of time that God's people would have understood and they knew in the midst of their suffering that it would not be without end. That in the midst of the suffering, even in the midst of the most intense persecution, God was limiting it in terms of how it could go. The one person writes, the most important point may be that God has a precise calendar for the events of world history, a calendar that is accurate to the day, yet at the same time utterly inscrutable to all human efforts to decode it. And the great challenge of suffering, whether it's persecution or sickness or grief, is that it feels like it's going to go on forever. It's hard to imagine when you're in the midst of suffering that there will ever be an end to it. And what this passage reminds us is, is that God has that time fixed. There will be an end to it. And even if in the worst case it does last for the entirety of your life, it will have an end. And as the book of Revelation reminds us, he himself will wipe away every tear, meaning he will be the one to comfort you in the end, and that comfort will more than repay any suffering that we have endured in the meantime. 
why was it so important that Daniel receive this vision, that he write it down, and that he seal it up? Because most of the events of this were going to happen after Daniel's time. The reason is because the people of God were going to need this whenever Antiochus showed up on the scene. Because what they will have seen by that point is how the prophecy had already been fulfilled in terms of the rise of the Medo-Persians, the rise of the Greeks, the downfall of the Greeks, the rise of the four generals underneath of him. And they could rest assured that as surely as all of those things happened exactly as God said, so also would Antiochus the little horn also be broken, though by no human hand. Calvin writes, if nothing had been predicted, the pious would have glided gently downwards to despair in consequence of their heavy afflictions. If this had not been predicted, they would have thought themselves deceived by the splendid promises concerning their return from exile. But when they perceived everything occurring according as they had been opportunely forewarned, this became no slight solace in the midst of their woes. They knew that God was writing the script, that he was in charge of all of this, and even though the suffering would be great and terrible, and unlike anything they had faced to that point, God was still on the throne, sovereignly ruling and working out his purposes, and therefore they could remain faithful. In other words, he had prepared them with this message so that when they entered into the hurt and into the suffering, they would be able to keep their eyes on the big picture of what God was accomplishing in the world. And the same is true for you and me. We don't know what form the suffering will take, what, when the hurt will come, but we know that that is the normal course of history for God's people in this world. And as surely as God was faithful to those people in that day, so he will be faithful to us in our day. We may not have a specific prophecy that tells us that it will end after 2,300 days, but we have multiple prophecies that tell us that it will end. And that at the end, Jesus will be on the throne and we will reign with him forever and ever. And that is the encouragement that we need to keep pressing on in the midst of the hurt and the pain and the difficulty. Peter warns the people similarly in 1 Peter chapter 4. And he says, beloved, do not be surprised. He's talking about persecution again. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. And then verse 19, therefore let those who suffer according to God's will Entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. These are our marching orders. God has given us the picture of history, how it's going to play out. Kingdoms are going to rise and fall. Every superpower is ultimately going down. Persecution is going to come, and persecution won't last forever. In the meantime, as you live out your place in this world, whether you're one of the world's superpowers or, or suffering under the boot of one of them, your call is to entrust your soul to the faithful creator and do good. It's as simple as that. So as we think about the outcome of the election yesterday, whether you were elated by it or you were disappointed by it or you're angry about it, your call yet still remains the same. To entrust your soul to our faithful creator and do good. That means that Christians can't respond to the outcome of this election like we might be tempted to respond to the outcome of the election. You might be tempted, if you were disappointed with yesterday's outcome, you might be tempted to say, I'm not going to get behind this president. I'm not going to pray for his success. I'm not going to pray that things will go well in this country because God forbid he might get elected a second time if he's still alive. And you might say, I'm, just, I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna be miserable here, and I'm gonna try to make life miserable for him and for everybody who voted him in office. You, maybe you felt that temptation. Maybe you feel that when you see your friends celebrating on Facebook or whatnot. That's not what Christians do. Uh, we pray for the peace of this place where God has called us to live. We work for good in this place where God has called us to live. We don't speak evil of anybody. 
We treat all people with courtesy, with gentleness, with love. Even when there are persecutors, even, when the, even if, the, if, 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 if the new president-elect should seek to kill Christians, Jesus says, bless those who persecute you. Pray for those who curse you. That's what a Christian looks like. That's what it looks like to be distinct in this world. That's what it looks like to entrust your soul to a faithful creator while doing good. And of course, we need to stand against injustice and wrongdoing and so on and to speak truth into a world that seeks to throw it to the ground. But expect that as we do that, we'll suffer. And when we suffer, we cannot resort to evil and defining evil with evil, but overcoming evil with good. Good as the Bible defines it. Finally, the worst evils must still serve the greatest good. We see that throughout the scripture. There is no evil that can be perpetrated by anybody in this world, not even by Satan himself, that God does not make to serve his purposes for his glory and for his people. Nothing that, does, that, that cannot work for the good of his people and his glory. You just have to decide if you're going to believe that or not. I can keep saying it week after week and will because it's in the Bible a lot. But, but you ultimately have to decide if that's true. And if that's true, that everything must work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And that all of history is unfailingly moving toward the appointed end where Jesus is seated on the throne and every knee is bowing and every tongue is confessing that he's Lord. If that's the way history is moving, then, well, then we can entrust our soul to a faithful creator while doing good, no matter what may come to us personally. If it's not true, then panic. <laughs> Go into the fetal position, lock yourself up in the bunker. All hope is lost. But if it is true, then we can sing, I have a hope. I have a future. I have a destiny that is yet awaiting me. My life's not over. A new beginning's just begun. I have this hope, and I have this hope. And it's rooted in what Jesus has done, and what he said, and what he's yet going to do. Listen, the final word of history will not be had by the ram or the goat, but by the lamb. And it won't be had by the elephant or by the donkey but by the lamb. <laughs> Pastor Chris reminded me of that. It's absolutely right. Jesus has the final word. Evil will have its day, but Jesus ultimately will have his way. And that's why we praise him. That's why we worship him. That's why we serve him. If you don't know Jesus, you need to know that humanity did its worst against him. He entered into this world as light, and the darkness of this world sought to extinguish him. And we committed the greatest act of injustice against any person the world has ever known. The only one who was innocent, who was truly good, who did good to all, was executed on a cross. What could be more bold-faced and shameful for humanity to do than to crucify the Son of God? And yet we did. It seemed evil had the victory. And yet even that dreadful act God has turned and worked for the good of his people and ultimately the glory of his name because now all of those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and say I believe you died on that cross for my sins that everyone who believes that the promise of scripture is that God will give you eternal life that you'll actually get to share in his eternal kingdom not that you deserve to share in his eternal kingdom that he's going to give it to you as a gift to live with him now and ultimately forever. And it's free for any who will receive it and accept it. And it's simply by faith alone. If you don't know him, I invite you to consider him. If you do know him, remember who he is and what he's like and what he's accomplishing in this world. And when you face the hard times, times of struggle, remember that it is the lamb who has the final word. Keep your faith in him. And that's the kind of faith that will sustain you for the long haul. Let's pray. Lord, we acknowledge that hard times are coming. We don't know when. We don't know exactly what they'll look like or what shape they'll take. But we know that through history, evil is going to continue to grow, even as good continues to grow. And the conflict is not getting less. It will get more intense. 
and faithfulness will be called for from your people, the kind of endurance that perseveres to the end, that we will need to be the kind of people who love not our lives even unto death. We're not used to thinking that way or living that way. But Lord, your word prepares us for it, and we seek to be prepared for it so that we would be faithful. That when suffering comes, we would not lash out. We wouldn't even consider it surprising. But that we would rejoice and that we've been counted worthy to suffer for the sake of the name, to uphold truth in a world that seeks to throw it to the ground. Lord, help us, keep us in the faith. May we be your faithful witnesses until you come and every eye sees you and every tongue confesses that you are the Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.